Good morning. My name is Tamiko, and I'm the Justice Pastor here at Purpose Church. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us in worshiping our God today. There is something at our church for everyone, no matter what age or stage. So follow our social media, check out our website, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to let us help you connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. Today, we continue our series called Unqualified Yet Chosen, a study on the life of David. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what's happening at our church. We are so excited that our annual team night is coming up. We want to celebrate all our regular volunteers with a get-together to enjoy a meal and receive encouragement. So mark your calendars for the evening of Wednesday, August 21st, and get ready for an awesome night. One of our core values at Purpose Church is that everyone is designed to serve. With so many ministry opportunities here, there is definitely a place for you to use your God-given gifts. For example, our guest services team is an integral part of our Sunday morning experience. Whether you would like to help make guests feel welcomed, serve our congregation at the merch store, or show your hospitality at the cafe, our guest services team needs you. Simply go to PurposeChurch.com serve for more information or to sign up. If you are ages 18 to 35, you're invited to Young Adults Nights every second and fourth Thursday of the month. The next YA night is this Thursday, July 11th. So come at 6.30 p.m. to spend time with other young adults through dinner, followed by a message. We hope to see you there. There are many other ways you can partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunities or to give online, go to purposechurch.com give. Now Pastor Claire is gonna lead us in a time of communion as we continue to worship. Now we will share the Lord's Supper together. Go ahead and pause the video right now to find some bread or crackers and a beverage. Anything that can represent the body and the blood of Christ will do. Whether you are worshiping online by yourself or with friends and family, this is a special time for us to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for everyone. He died on the cross for our sins, then rose victoriously from the dead. And now we live with hope for the future as we anticipate his glorious return. So as we eat and drink, let's take some time to reflect upon these truths with thanksgiving in our hearts.
seek to find your truth and your mercy is the shade I'm living in you restore my faith and hope again and all I did was praise all I did was
we thank you that you're such a good, good father and that we can trust you, Lord. We can trust you with our burdens and with our concerns, God, with any of our fears and doubts, Lord. And by faith, Lord, I declare that we will put our trust in you, Father. So Lord, we praise you and we honor you this morning, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hello and welcome Purpose Church online community. My name is Eric and I'm one of the pastors here and I'm so glad you're joining us today. And I say this every single week, I love you Purpose Church online family, wherever you're watching or listening from. And more than anything, you need to know this, God loves you. Well, let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter one. And while you're flipping to 2 Samuel chapter one, if you're a guest or a visitor joining us for the first time, or you're new to Purpose Church, we would love to get to know you. In fact, we love to help you find community and discover God's purpose for your life. And so I'd love to invite you to take a moment to visit our Next Steps webpage, purposechurch.com slash next steps, where you can fill out our digital connect card. You can learn about some of our ministries as we want to get to know you and help you find and follow Jesus. Well, we're in the middle of our summer series called Unqualified Yet Chosen, where we are journeying with the most famous king of the Old Testament, that is King David. And today we find ourselves talking about grieving when it's complicated. But before we get too far into that, it is summer. And at Purpose Church, we have some new summer merch that we are so excited about. We want to encourage you to pick that up when you join us here in person. You can get some of this new Purpose merch. And we even have these new croc gibbets or croc charms, these Purpose Church croc gibbets. And I'm telling you, these things are awesome. And, and my kids have assured me I'm not cool enough to use the words riz and skibbity, but I'm just telling you, these things are bussin', all right? And I know some of you are like sighing. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to stay relevant here. Well, let's talk about our text today. David's grief was complicated. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, it goes like this. After the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from? David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked, tell me. The men fled from the battle, he replied. Many of them, many of them fell and died and Saul and his son, Jonathan are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said. And there was Saul leaning on his spear with the chariots and their drivers in hot pursuit. When he, return, when he turned around and saw me, he called out to me. And I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. Then he said to me, stand here by me and kill me. I'm in the throes of death, but I'm still alive. So I stood behind him, beside him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son, Jonathan, and for the army of the Lord, and for the nation of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David is shook. He is shocked. Saul, his king, his father-in-law, his enemy is dead. Jonathan, his best friend, is dead. The Lord's army is being disgraced by the Philistines, and Israel has fallen and is crumbling. David is deep in grief. 
And maybe some of you are grieving right now. And I don't know what you're grieving over, but you know that you are in a season of grief. I want to encourage you. This is the best book recommendation I could offer. It's called Good Grief by Granger E. Westberg. And this guy, he, he, he kind of is a, a pastor and a therapist, and he offers such incredible words and insights to help you and I as we are grieving. But as we go back to our text, 2 Samuel chapter 1 actually raises a really important question. And the question is this, is there a contradiction in the Bible about the details of King Saul's death? You see, there's a major, there's some major differences between how King Saul's death is described in 1 Samuel 31 and 2 Samuel chapter 1. Now, both accounts report that Saul died on Mount Gilboa. However, 1 Samuel 31 records that Saul asked his armor bearer to draw his sword and kill him, but he wouldn't. So fell, so Saul fell on his own sword and died. However, the Amalekite in 2 Samuel chapter 1 reports that he killed Saul. Now, some have pointed to these two stories and try to use them as proof that the Bible contradicts itself and therefore cannot be trusted. However, if you dig deeper, you will not see a contradiction, but rather two different angles of the same story intermixed with a lie from a reward-motivated Amalekite. Most scholars agree that the Amalekite here lied about how he found Saul and how he aided him in his death because the Amalekite likely believed his false version of the story would earn him a great reward and might even please David for aiding in the vacancy of a king over Israel. So the true story surrounding Saul's death is this. Saul's critically injured on Mount Gilboa. This is both recorded in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Saul's armor bearer is asked, but he refuses to kill Saul in 1 Samuel. Saul then falls on his own sword and dies as is recorded in 1 Samuel. Now the Amalekite found Saul dead and took his crown and arm bound, the last part as recorded in 2 Samuel. And then the Amalekite lied to David, gave him Saul's royal garb, hoping for a reward or some kind of promotion. And then ultimately David ends up punishing the Amalekite for killing Saul. Walter Brueggemann, the famous Old Testament scholar, he says this, the messenger or the Amalekite is waiting for a reward, foolishly imagining he has delivered the crown to David, thinking wrongly that David would gladly receive the throne from his hand. The messenger is an outsider. He cannot know that the crown is given only by God and not by a murdering stranger. Now, friends, the next time somebody says to you, the Bible contradicts itself. The Bible is full of contradictions. I want to encourage you to challenge them and to say, where? What specifically are you referring to? And then when that text or those passages are specifically brought up, do a deep dive, dig into those verses, dig into the context, look at some trusted commentaries and voices, and what you will find together is some actually reasonable explanations. It's kind of like when Sarah and I were dating, early on in our dating, uh, we were invited to her cousin's wedding out in Texas. And I was really excited about this because this was my first opportunity to meet Sarah's extended family in Texas. And so the rest of Sarah's family who's here in California flew out to Texas. And then Sarah and I were on a flight. We're going to go get, a, get on a flight to Texas. And so we got to the airport really early and we got to our gate, you know, a few hours before takeoff. And we're literally sitting at those seats that are right in front of our gate. Well, we begin a conversation with the people sitting next to us and we discover that they were going to the wedding as well, that they were friends of Sarah's cousins. And so we're just talking and getting to know each other and sharing stories. And before we even realized it, as soon as that conversation wrapped up, we looked, at front, we looked in front of us and the plane was gone. They had boarded everybody. Everybody was off to Texas and we had missed our flight. And I gotta be honest, this looked horrible. And all the thoughts were coming into my head. I was going, this girl is never going to marry me. She's never going to marry me. She's like, what kind of idiot misses the flight with the gate right in front of you? 
But we didn't stop there. We didn't allow how this looked horrible to stop us from continuing to move forward. And so we talked with the airline. We explained the story. They had pity on us. They got us a flight to Arizona and there was about a two hour layover in Arizona. And we decided for some reason to leave the airport to kind of drive around Arizona. And with our track record, I'm not sure why we did that, but we decided to do that. And, and as we were leaving the airport in Arizona to kind of drive around, there was a whole row of taxis. And I went up to the taxi driver and I asked him, how much would it be uh, for you to just kind of drive us around a little bit to see the city? And he shared with us the price. And then I noticed there was one limousine at the very end of all this row of taxis. And so I went up to the limousine driver and I said, hey, look, man, um, this is how much the taxi driver would charge us. Would you be willing to do it for the same price? And nobody else was asking for a limo. So he said, sure. We jumped in the tax or we jumped in a limousine. We're cruising around Arizona. I'm redeeming this date. This girl's fallen in love with me all over again. We made it to the wedding and everything was great. You see, at one, at one point, this looked horrible. And sometimes when you read a passage in the Bible or a story, you may at a first glance look at it and go, man, this looks horrible. And I don't know how to exactly reconcile this. But I want to encourage you, your great questions deserve great answers. And at Purpose Church, we want to help you explore those. In fact, joining a life group, something you could do by going to our Next Steps webpage, is a great way to get in community with other people who are studying God's word and examining some of these difficult questions within scripture. At Purpose Church, it is safe to have questions about God's word. Well, back to David's grief. David's grief demonstrates a couple common stages for us. You see, because God loves us so much, he has wired us with the ability to grieve loss. And at first, that usually involves feelings of anger. We saw David and his men uh, tearing their clothes. It usually looks like visible expressions of emotions. This is why David and his men, they mourned and they wept. And then oftentimes there's a lack of desire to even do the most basic things like eating. Maybe that was partially what motivated David and his men to fast. But David's grief process didn't end there. In fact, in verse 17, it says, David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son, Jonathan. And he ordered that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jashar. You see, here's something really important about David. David reminds us that real men don't avoid their feelings. Real men process their feelings. There's this myth somewhere in our culture that real men aren't supposed to cry, that real men don't feel emotions, that real men aren't in touch with their emotions. But you look at David and he is strong. He's a warrior. He's a man of God. And he also has the ability to express emotions. And maybe this is one of the challenges within the relationships that you're in right now. Maybe, let me just talk to the men for a moment. Maybe you're having a hard time or the people around you are having a hard time connecting with you because you're struggling to show those emotions because maybe somewhere deep down inside, you believe that you're not a man if you show those emotions. But David actually shows us otherwise. Now, there are definitely times when you're grieving where you need to take a step back. I remember when my grandma Betty passed away, we called her Grammy. I remember when she passed away. There's some pictures of me with her and, and our papa um, and my sister Elizabeth. I, I remember when uh, Grammy passed away and our whole family was surrounding her. And I remember my dad, I remember watching him cry as he was saying his goodbyes to his mom. I, I remember watching my, my grandpa, papa. I remember watching him hold grandma's, Grammy's hand and, and say, it's okay, Betty, you can go. It's okay. And I remember right after she passed away, I almost immediately, I was a young boy at this time, I almost immediately went into another room and just started playing video games because I, I just needed to kind of remove myself from the situation. I needed to step away for a little bit, but, but here's the thing, stepping away helps until it hurts. Part of grieving is, is knowing when it's time to lean back into the pain of what you're experiencing because the reality of grief is, you can't go around it. You can't avoid it. You have to go through it. 
And as you go through the stages of grief, you'll experience God's healing and God restoring you with hope. You'll, you'll find yourself not stuck in the, the acuteness of that pain anymore. And, and what did David do? David grieved by writing a poem. And the theme of this poem is repeated three times where he says, the mighty have fallen, talking about Saul and Jonathan, the mighty have fallen. In fact, in the middle of this poem, he says in verse 23, Saul and Jonathan, in life they were loved and admired, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was more wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. You see, in verse 23, David describes Saul and Jonathan as loved and admired. And then in verse 24, he specifically focuses on Saul. He talks about the, the national stability that Saul brought, the, how Saul grew the economy. And then he ends by focusing on Jonathan, describing this best friend and, and how dear he was to him. Which is why based on David's grieving of Saul and Jonathan, I want to look at four things everyone grieves and the truth God wants us to hold on to. Number one is this, we grieve change because we are losing something. You know, the morning of our congregational vote at Purpose Church here, that morning that at, at where, you know, the congregational vote was at the end of the day where Purpose Church, you all voted me as your next lead pastor. That morning, um, I woke up and I was on a run and, and I was just experiencing some spiritual warfare. I, I was just feeling some discouragement from Satan. I was I was thinking through all the reasons that, that I am not qualified. I, I was thinking about past sins in my life. I mean, Satan was just bringing to mind all of these things that were making me nervous and, and anxious. And, and yet halfway through that run, I, I, I got this picture. I felt like I got this picture from God of, of Jesus holding my right hand and leading me. And I got to tell you that early morning with no one else out there on the path I was running, it was a powerful experience with the Lord. You see, I was just feeling so vulnerable and so insecure, and I, I just felt Jesus holding my right hand and leading me. But then the, the, the cynical nature within me sort of asked the question, okay, that's a cool picture, but is it biblical? Like, is it, is it biblical? And sometimes, you know, we think things, we feel things, and, and if we're not careful, we'll just kind of assume all of our feelings are good and all of our feelings are from God. And so I wanted to ask the question, okay, was that really from God? Is it based in scripture? And then later in the day, God drew my attention to Isaiah 43, Isaiah 41, 13, which says, for I am the Lord, your God. It's one of those moments where God is speaking directly to us. For I am the Lord, your God, who takes hold of your, you got it, right hand who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. And it was such a powerful passage for me because it reminded me again that God is personal, that he is powerful, and that God is proactive in the way that he pursues us. Because I gotta be honest with you, church family, when I think about grieving change and losing something, the thing I'm grieving, I think we're all grieving, is the loss of Pastor Glenn as our lead pastor and Kimberly as our lead pastor's wife. I'm grieving this and I know you're grieving it as well. And of course, we are so happy for them. We're so excited for this next season. They have been so faithful these past 31 years to lead our church. We are celebrating them, but we're grieving them. And as your next lead pastor, I need you to know that I'm grieving. And so it's okay for you to grieve. And here's the cool part. We are gonna grieve together. Yes, we are believing and we know that God has a future for us and that God is leading us into the future, but God is also inviting us to be present in the here and now and to grieve together. You see, maybe you're grieving something else 
Or maybe there's additional things that you're grieving in your life. Maybe you're grieving a graduate or, or a young adult moving out of your house. I remember when I was a senior in high school, it was October and I came home one day and I could hear my mom crying in her bedroom. And so I ran into my mom's room and I said, mom, are you okay? I thought somebody in our family had passed away. And she just looked up at me and she said, you're graduating and I'm crying. And I just was like, mom, it's October. We've got nine more months, but she was grieving. And, and maybe you're grieving about something like that. Maybe you're grieving a change of jobs or a workplace. Maybe you're raising young kids and you're grieving as they transition into different stages because you're well aware that while the days feel really long, the years are really short. Maybe you're grieving because there's family members who don't know Christ or who aren't following him closely. Well, with that, I want to encourage you with this. When you're grieving because change brings loss, remember this. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so if you're brokenhearted as you're grieving change or loss, if you feel crushed in your spirit, you need to know that God is close to you and that he will save you from this grief, that he will walk you through this grief. Number two, we grieve complicated relationships because we long for restoration. I mean, think about it. Saul was a very complicated person in David's life, right? Saul was David's king. Saul was David's father-in-law. And Saul was David's enemy who was trying to murder him. That is the very definition of complicated. And yet in David's poem, of remembering Saul, he was able to provide a short list of things that he was grateful to Saul for. Yeah, he wasn't ignoring the pain and the tragedy and even the trauma that Saul had brought on him. He, he wasn't lying about what was actually the full story, but he was able to talk about some of the good things, which is why I want to encourage you if if you've got a complicated relationship in your life or if you're grieving a complicated relationship, maybe there's somebody who, who you had a complicated relationship with in your life and they're gone or it's impossible for you to ever have any reconciliation or restoration with them. I want to encourage you, if possible, to focus on whatever was good about that relationship. Even if you can only come up with one thing, to allow yourself to, to remember and think about that one good thing and to remember and to be honest about the bad things, about the things that hurt you, about the pain and trauma. You can hold both of those in tension. And then I want to invite you to go to God for healing. Your heart needs God's healing and, and God wants to heal you through his word, through prayer, through the power of worship music, through the power of being in a life group. Maybe you're not in a life group right now. This is a great reason to join a life group. If you're grieving right now, if there's a complicated relationship, get in a community with other people who love Jesus, who can remind you and encourage you. I, I want to encourage you to go to God. Maybe it's going to a Christian therapist that could support you. And, and I want to remind you of this. When you're grieving because the relationship is complicated or was complicated, Remember this, Psalm 147, verse three, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You see, in Psalm 34, we're told the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And in Psalm 147, we learn that he heals the brokenhearted. And this is the power of God. This is what's so incredible about being in a relationship with God is God has the power to heal your broken heart, even if it's impossible to ever have reconciliation or restoration. Even if it's impossible for that person to ever apologize to you or own the pain and the trauma that they caused in your life, God can still, by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring his healing into your life. Number three, we grieve when a loved one passes because they were dear to us. You see, this is what we see between David and Jonathan. I mean, look at the words of David. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love, was, your love for me was wonderful. 
What, what's David saying? He's saying, Jonathan, I felt so known by you. I felt so loved by you. And this is what's so hard when a, when a family member or, or a close friend passes away, is we felt so known and loved by them, and now they're gone. And you see, we're in this weird place as a culture where our culture is so obsessed with sexual relationships and romantic relationships as if those are the most important relationships, as if those should be prized above every other relationship. I mean, when was the last time that you saw a reality TV show about helping people become friends, helping people find a best friend? No, it's all about finding someone you can hook up with, finding someone that you can marry. That's what our culture is obsessed with. But the Bible is full of so many examples of deep friendships between people who loved each other and who knew each other and who cared for each other in such godly ways. Because the Bible is constantly reminding us that friendship is truly a gift from God. And if you don't have a close friend right now, and I know I sound like I'm just beating a dead horse here, get in a life group, join a life group, connect with other people who love Jesus who you can develop a strong friendship with. And you see, when somebody passes away who you love, a loved one that was dear to you, you're going to grieve. It's important to grieve. In fact, sometimes Christians fall into the trap of thinking, well, because I'm a Christian, and because I know if that person loved Jesus, I'm going to see them again someday, I, I shouldn't grieve. I should just be okay. Actually, the Bible speaks against that in this verse that oftentimes gets misinterpreted. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Now, some people will wrongly interpret this and say, look, the Bible says you shouldn't grieve. You should just have a lot of hope. That is not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, grieve, but grieve as someone who also has hope. And you see, the stages of grief are going to be different for each person. But we are invited to grieve with also a sense of hope. I remember several years ago, a, a family in our church invited me into their process of grieving. They had just lost their child. It was a stillborn birth. And I remember this husband and wife, they were on very different stages of their grieving, and it was really difficult for them. And one of the things I just kept telling them over and over again is run to God with your pain instead of running away from him because of it. I think there's some of you out here right now, some of you watching or listening at home or with a group of people and, and you're grieving something. And there's something in you, there's a temptation in you to run away from God because of this grief. And maybe you've been wrongfully taught scriptures like this. And you go, well, you know what? I'm grieving. And so I I just got to run away from God. No, the invitation in all of scripture is actually to run towards God with your grief because he can handle it because he loves you. I remember a couple weeks ago, I had the privilege of officiating a memorial service for George Grant. And the Grant family is, is one of those families here at Purpose Church that run like four generations deep here at Purpose Church. They're an incredible family. And, and four days before George passed away to be with Jesus, I had the opportunity to sit in his living room and to have a conversation with him. And, and George spent those couple hours talking about the three things that he's most passionate about. The first one was his family. He just talked about how much he loved his family. The second thing he spent a lot of time talking about is his love for food, specifically Mexican food. In fact, four days before he passes to be with Jesus, he was getting real animated and energetic. He started to draw out on his hand, turn by turn directions of how he wanted me to go to his favorite Mexican restaurants. And then lastly, George talked about most importantly, his love for Jesus. And George was so excited to be with Jesus. It it reminded me of the words of D.L. Moody, that 19th century American preacher and evangelist who said, someday you will read in the newspapers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. 
You see, if you're grieving someone in your life who's no longer here and they love Jesus, you can be confident that they are more alive than we could ever fully imagine. And for all of us who love Jesus, and if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've received him as your Lord and Savior, you can be confident that you will see them again. And then George, he, he offered me some advice. In fact, I asked him, I said, what advice do you have for me, George? And he said, every morning, don't forget about the Lord. And so when you're grieving because your loved one is no longer here, remember this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We know that our loved ones who love Jesus, they are in heaven with Jesus celebrating. But this side of eternity, we feel the sting of death. And rather than running away from God, I want to encourage you to, to heed the words of Jesus who invited you and me to come to him, not all cleaned up, not having processed all of our grief and pain on our own, but to come to him in, in the broken states and places that we are. And lastly, number four, we grieve injustice because we were designed for righteousness. And maybe you've asked the question, why is there suffering and injustice in the world? Well, here's, here's three thoughts. Number one, God chose to create and love humanity, but he did not force humanity to love him in return. And by rejecting God and his ways, we became exposed to and participants in sin, death, injustice, and evil. This is what's being described in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all have sinned. Here, here would be my second response, number two. Even though our sin and rebellion is the cause of suffering and injustice, God is perfectly loving, perfectly wise, and perfectly working to bring healing and restoration to us and through us. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then number three, all of us experience some measure of suffering and pain. Yet God can equally use the joys and sorrows we face to demonstrate his power to us and through us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is describing this thorn in his side, this, this consistent suffering, this continual suffering that he's experiencing. And, and it says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, maybe at this point, though, you're going, okay, that makes sense theologically, but that's not very emotionally satisfying because maybe you're experiencing a measure of suffering right now maybe you're seeing some injustice happening in the world and for you i would say i am so thankful that god not only inspired but chose to preserve psalm 137 because you see psalm 137 was written in the sixth century bc while the israelites were in exile under Babylonian rule. And that, that season was incredibly painful and difficult for them. They were mistreated and there was all kinds of injustices and sufferings happening. And Israel as a nation is grieving and the psalmist that we are gonna read here is as well grieving individually. Look at these words, these surprising words that are recorded in the Bible. Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. 
Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Wow. These are the words of a grieving person. The psalmist is describing what it was like to have their tormentors, their persecutors, their torturers demand them sing songs while being tormented. The psalmist is describing what it was like to, to watch their babies being thrown in the air and dashed against the rocks. And to be honest, they're angry. They're grieving the injustice because they were designed. We were all designed for righteousness, for right relationship with God and right relationship with others. And injustices are never okay with God. And they are always an offense against God. You see, it's why Dr. Esau Macaulay said this about Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is not merely a shout of defiance. It is a prayer addressed to God. Traumatized communities must be able to tell God the truth about what they feel. We must trust that God can handle those emotions. God can listen to our cries for vengeance. And as the one sovereign over history, he gets to choose how to respond. Psalm 137 does not take power from God and give it to us. It is an affirmation of his power in the midst of deep pain and estrangement. Now, the thing about injustices and suffering is that as we're grieving them and as we're coming to places of healing, we will find God inviting us to partner with him, to partner with him to end these injustices. And there are countless, innumerable injustices happening all around the world, even injustices in our own community here. And I just want to draw our attention to one of them. There are so many kids in our community who need a home. Kids in the foster care system who, who need a safe place to live, a safe family who loves Jesus and could show them how much God loves them. You see, in, in Proverbs 31, verse 8, it says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that God, our fathers, that, our, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Yes, living a life of holiness living a life of righteousness, of right relationship with God, reading God's word and living your life in alignment with his word and, and abstaining from sin. That is absolutely a central part of following Jesus. But so is looking out for the vulnerable. So is caring for those who need that help. You know, the movie just came out called The Sound, Sound of Hope. It's by Angel Studios, and it's a movie inspired by the powerful true story of Donna and Reverend Martin, who inspired and mobilized their small rural Texas Baptist church to embrace kids in the foster system in their community. By doing the impossible, this small group of Jesus followers adopted 77 children in East Texas and proved to the world that with God's love and help, the battle for America's most vulnerable can be won. Now, I want to invite you to, number one, go see this movie. I want to challenge you and encourage you to go see this movie. But more than anything, I want to invite you to a very specific call to action. I want to invite you to pray about this. Our chosen ministry here at Purpose Church is focused on supporting adoptive and foster families in our church. 
and they are hosting a resource parent or foster parent orientation event in partnership with the Department of Child and Family Services on Saturday, July 27th from 10 a.m. to noon in H104 here on our Purpose Church campus where lunch will be provided. And my wife, Sarah and I, we are gonna be at this event and I wanna prayerfully invite you and encourage you to join us. This important event is an opportunity for all of us to learn how we can transform the lives of vulnerable children in the foster care system in our community. If you are interested in supporting foster care families, or if you are interested in being a foster care family, or if you are already a foster care family, this event is for you. The Bible commands us as Christians to be involved in caring for the vulnerable. And I believe God has been putting this on the hearts of many in our church. And maybe you've just been waiting for a sign. Maybe you've just been needing a sign. This is your sign. Mark your calendar, Saturday, July 27th. Join my wife, Sarah, and I here on the Purpose Church campus, along with our chosen ministry for this incredible event. We as a church are committed to caring for the vulnerable and supporting families who care for children in the foster care system. Now, as we close, the truth is this. Grief, no matter how complicated, no matter how painful, no matter how long it lasts, is one of God's gifts to us. Because, you see, grief helps us to feel whatever it is that we're feeling in our moments of pain and suffering. Grief gives us an opportunity to grow and to become more like Christ. And the Holy Spirit will use grief to draw each one of us deeper and closer to God. Which is why I want to end with this question. How is God revealing his deep love for you right now in the middle of whatever you are grieving? Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for my church family. I want to especially lift up the people in our community who are grieving. You know exactly what they are grieving right now. And God, I pray that you would be close to them, that they would feel your presence, that they would feel your healing, that they would know that you love them. And I pray that no matter how complicated their grief is, that they would know, God, you are in the business of restoring and healing us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, my name is Sham and I'm pastor of Global Missions at Purpose Church. Thank you for joining us. And remember to follow our social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website so you can stay connected to everything happening at our church. I hope to see you in person or online again soon.